Welcome to day 16 of the 2023 Advent of Code. Today's problem is another grid problem. So on the grid, we have a bunch of empty spaces and mirrors and splitters. The mirrors are placed diagonally and the splitters are placed vertically and horizontally. The beam enters the top left corner from the left side, so it starts right to the left of this cell here and then moves towards the right. Then the behavior changes based on what it encounters. On empty spaces, nothing happens. If the beam hits a mirror, which is one of the diagonals, then it is reflected 90 degrees based on which way the mirror faces. If it hits the pointy end of a splitter, it does nothing, so a downward beam moving through a pipe would not change. If it encounters the flat side of a splitter, however, it will split into two beams going in each of the two directions that the splitter points towards. So for example, a beam moving rightward into this splitter would end up going up and down. Beams don't interact at all with each other, and a tile can have a bunch of beams going through it at the same time. A tile is energized if that tile has at least one beam over it, uh, either passing through it normally, reflecting in it, or splitting on it. So here's a filled out diagram for the uh, example, with the two indicating that there are two beams passing through it. However, it doesn't matter in this problem how many beams pass through each uh, cell. So here's a diagram with all of the energized cells shown instead, and with all of the splitters and mirrors removed. In this case, 46 tiles are energized. So we first must analyze our current situation. How many tiles end up energized? So let's first grab our input. And now this is a relatively standard uh, breadth first fill. Basically, we just keep track of where the head of every beam is, and then we just progress one by one until eventually we've seen every state that we need to. So we're going to import the deck class from collections, and we'll use this as a queue. It's a bit easier to use than the built-in queue class, if I remember correctly. With the queue, essentially what happens is we insert elements, and then the first element inserted is also the first element removed. It's also called first in, first out. This is the opposite of a stack. With a stack, the first in is the last out, so the most recently placed item is removed first, just like with a literal stack of objects. So we're going to start out, uh, A is just a temporary variable name. We're going to start with one beam head, and we're going to start it right to the left of the first element. So we will store this in the format rcdrdc. And what that means is we'll have the row and the column coordinate first, and then the direction, uh, the delta row and the delta column, so basically which direction it is moving in. Initially, we start at row zero, column negative one, so right to the left of the grid, and then the direction is the rows are not, are not changing, and we're moving by one plus one column each time. And we'll record this state in scene and in the queue. Actually, um, we're not going to record it in CNA, you'll see why later. Okay, so now we want to basically just run the simulation. So while the queue is not empty, we're going to grab RC, DR, and DC from the left side of the queue. And then we're going to first advance forward. So R plus equals DR and C plus equals DC. And now we need to check if it's out of bounds. So if zero is, if R is less than zero or R is greater than or equal to the number of rows or C is less than zero or C is greater than the number of columns, then we're going to continue. So skip progressing. Otherwise, we're going to check what the character at the current position is. If the character is a dot, we want to pass over it like an empty cell. Alternatively, if the character is a horizontal splitter and we're currently moving along a row, so the column delta is changing, then we also treat it as an empty cell. Finally, if we're facing a vertical splitter and the row delta is, zero, is not zero, so we're moving vertically, in all of these examples, we want to just pass through it normally. So we will say if rcdrdc not in scene, then we'll add it to scene and also add it to the queue.
In the other example, we have mirrors. So otherwise, if the character is equal to this mirror, then we're going to flip dr and dc. And so if we're going right, we end up going up. If we're going left, we end up going down. And so basically, if we're going right, 0, 1 gets mapped to going up, which is um, negative 1, 0. Moving down gets mapped to moving left. Moving up gets mapped to moving right. And moving left gets mapped to moving down. So essentially, for any R, dr and dc, we're mapping it to negative dc, negative dr. And so we can just say dr dc equals negative dc, negative dr. And then if, and then we can just repeat this basically. Otherwise, if it's a backslash, we do essentially the same thing, but we do not invert the values because our uh, flip is facing the other way this time. So we just swap dr and dc like so. Otherwise, this is where things get interesting. And so regardless of which way the beam is currently facing, so whether it's going left or right, when it hits a vertical splitter, it'll go up and down. So we don't need to care about what our original directions were anymore. So we can say for dr dc in, and then we will have a list. So if the character is a vertical splitter, we'll have a list of the two vertical movements. So uh, going down and going up. Otherwise, if the character is a horizontal splitter, we'll have the movements right and left. And now we can basically just do the same thing. If rc dr dc not in the scene, uh, actually, sorry, let me just copy paste this over. Okay. And now at the end, um, we do consider that sometimes we'll have C and will contain duplicate coordinates. The reason for that being that dr and dc might be different. So basically we're passing through in different directions. And so we'll want to discard the dr and dc. So we'll say chords equals rc for rc blank blank in C. And then we at the end we can just print the number of coordinates that our beam encountered. And so that gives us our answer for part one. For part two, we note that our beam can enter from any edge tile heading away from the edge. So basically we can't start in the middle and we can't start at the top and move right. If we start in a corner, we can go in either direction. So if we start in the top left corner, we can either go down or right, but we cannot go like uh, left, obviously. And now our objective is to maximize the number of energized tiles. So let's wrap this entire thing in a function. So we're going to have it accept RC, DR, and DC. So we're going to say um, def calculate RC, DR, DC. And then instead of feeding it these, we'll give it RC, DR, DC as the initial ones. And then we will return the length of the chords instead. Okay, now we just need to iterate through each of the possible entry points. So we'll start with the maximum value being zero, and then we'll first try each of the rows. So for each row, we can either start at the left side, or we can start at the right side. And note that we want to start just off the grid in both examples. The reason for that is actually because we only check this after we've moved. So if we started within the grid, we might start on top of a mirror or splitter and that would cause issues. And then we want to try each column. So for each column, we can either start at the top or we can start at the bottom. And finally, we just print out the maximum value. So this takes a bit of time to run, but it still runs perfectly reasonably timed. So that gives us our answer for part two. So thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed.